replica. Um, I've been honored to have every week with the Arnie Ecosystem. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Arnie Wick, who's with the Montana DNRC, the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, uh, in the Water Management Bureau. And, and Arnie's been involved very deeply in probably one of the most historic water rights compacts in the history of the state. Um, and this is a compact between the state of Montana and the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of the Flathead Nation. And it's been, we're going to hear all about it. It's been really, really exciting for the past few years. Is that a good word for it? Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's, that's accurate. Um, and we're really glad you came. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Aiden. Thank honored to be here. I'm actually an MSU alum, so it's nice to be back. I won't disclose how long it's been since I've been on campus, but it's nice to be back. Uh, and wander through the neighborhood from Wilson on the way back. So a trip down memory lane there of sorts. So uh, yeah, as Wyatt uh, mentioned, Arnie Wick is my name. I uh, currently live in Helena um, and work in the Water Management Bureau's Compact Implementation Section, which I supervise. Um, uh, so what I wanted to do here is give, tier this in several ways. I wanted to generally, I'm here to talk about the CSKT Compact, kind of the last few years, last four years, the last few legislative sessions cover that, um, and wanted to touch on the history of the Reserve Water Right Compact Commission, kind of their role in the state's general statewide stream adjudication, uh, touch on what reserve water rights are, then I wanted to drill down into some of the advantage of a, a negotiated settlement, um, kind of give a history of what the commission's accomplished in its, since 1979, 35 years, uh, look at the process a little bit of what the compact goes through as far as negotiation and approval at various levels and governments. Um, then wanted to get into a more of a timeline on the CSKT. It's been actively negotiated for 10 years, but it goes back to the early 80s. So I, I have a rough outline of kind of some monumental court decisions and events that I think help educate and provide a little history and context. Um, there are more timeline events than uh, I wanted, but uh, I think for an appropriate bite of history and some context, I think that'll be appropriate. Uh, then we'll move on to current implementation. Unlike other compacts, there are a few near-term implementation tasks that we are undertaking at, upon state ratification. So we'll touch on that. And then at the end, we'll talk about claim filings and alternative, the alternative to the compact. Um, so I just wanted to give a broad overview of how I was hoping to approach this. At any time, if you have a question, please interrupt. Uh, another reason for having this outline is we can get back on track so I don't wander too far on a tangent, um, which may, may occur. But uh, with that, I just wanted to start with uh, the statutory mandate of the Reserve Water Right Compact Commission, which is identified in Montana Code is to conclude compacts for equitable division and apportionment of waters between the state and its people and several Indian tribes and federal government and the federal government claiming reserve water. What are reserve rights? So reserve rights are well, these creatures that are established when the United States through an act of Congress uh, through an uh, act of Congress uh, executive order uh, reserve what right what uh, land out of the public domain for like uh, Indian reservation or a national park or a national wildlife refuge uh, reserve rights were confirmed in a case that originated out of the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana it was a 1908 Supreme Court decision titled winners uh, that case is right uh, I think the most commonly referenced case in case law related to reserve water rights um, and the Montana Supreme Court has relied on this in several uh, decisions over the years. So that's a little bit of background on reserve rights. Um, one thing I was wondering about how to sprinkle this in is talking about reserve rights, the, the commission and kind of the broader statewide adjudication. Um, so we'll get to that next. Or I guess we'll get to that here shortly. Um, Tribal water rights present unique challenges. Generally, they're the most senior, have the earliest priority date, and often provide a, you know, have a large geographic extent and scope. So they generally are large, <clears throat> and for those reasons, they provide be at risk uh, state-based water users. Uh, quantification of tribal rights. So 
things unique to a reserve right as opposed to a state-based beneficial right. Uh, reserve rights can be used for future uses. Uh, they can't be abandoned through non-use, and they don't have to have been proven up on or uh, put to beneficial use. I think at this point I'll talk about, so the reserve rights, these are all, the state's authority to uh, negotiate these and address them has been through the Reserve Water Right Compact Commission, which was established back in 1979. Uh, the reserve water rights through negotiated settlement go through uh, the party. So so in a treaty with uh, our, so we have a tribal, tribal, Tribal compact, for example, then we have the state negotiating on behalf of the state, and then we have the United States and trust for the tribes. So that situation, that negotiation occurs. If it, we come to an agreement in principle, that goes back to the full commission, which votes on it. At that point, it would go to the Montana legislature, which would then vote. And at this point, they've approved all 18 compacts in Montana, the legislature has. So those are kind of the reserve water right package that would then go to the water court the reserve rights. The state-based rights are rights that were filed by individuals statewide back in 1982. So those are all rolled into the water court decree process uh, as part of what the court ultimately decrees. So I wanted to tie together those state-based and reserve rights, so try to take a stab at it there. I have another slide a little bit later. Hopefully this becomes a little more clear. If there's any questions, I'm not just hollering. Advantage of a negotiated settlement, uh, primary purpose of the commission in negotiating, and this is a theme that's consistent through their negotiation history, is to protect existing state-based water use. Um, settlement also allows for flexible and creative solutions where parties re all re parties retain something of value. Um, a little later, I have a table on the CSCT off reservation rights. In one of the columns, you'll see kind of some of the summaries of how they are enforced. First, I think it'll come clear that there's ways water rights can be conditioned so they don't call out somebody completely. It allows flexibility in operation, so not everybody's called or turned off. So the senior water users are, are totally protected from this, or the juniors are just curious? Or? Well, this, that slide, it is a little bit confusing. That refers to assuming a tribal treaty date would predate any uh, state-based water use. So any state-based or privately held water rate would be junior to a senior water rate. Yeah, that's a little confusing. So with respect to the timing, Arnie, have there been situations where the water court has adjudicated the basin and then a compact came along and sort of turned everything over post facto? That may be occurring now. Um, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. I think, uh, for example, if you look at the statewide adjudication map, I think one of the more recent court orders that came out was to finish state-based water use examination on the Flathead Basin. Um, so so no it is a chicken and the egg thing here, is we have you know the state motivated and the court motivated to finish the, the adjudication of these, but these compacts being on somewhat of a slow track historically. Blackfeet's another example. I think those state-based water rights up uh, on the east side of Glacier Park on the Blackfeet Reservation, state-based water rights, I think, have been adjudicated. Uh, but you have a compact that's now on its fourth con Congress with Blackfeet. So it's a chicken and the egg scenario. Yes? State water rights go with the state water rights that are land? Unless they're severed from the land, they would if the title is quiet, they would transfer with the land, unless split or otherwise. Touching on a little bit of the success or history of what the commission's done. So since 79, the commission has negotiated 18 water settlements. Uh, the commission includes nine members, uh, four appointed by the governor, um, one state senator, two state senators, one Democrat and Republican, and same for the House, and then uh, Attorney General appointed. So there's nine. Um, currently, there are no current appointments, but the commission has not been formally sunsetted by the legislature, so I think we're in this holding pattern to see 
if anything else needs to be negotiated. Honestly, I think getting a CSTT compact through was all anybody could handle. So I think that'll be revisited most likely before the next session. All 18 have been approved by the Montana legislature. Uh, this is, uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier, so sorry for the disjointed attempt on this one. So here we have negotiations. Uh, these occur when the parties reach out to each other and exchange informal correspondence to come to the table and negotiate. Um, if a negotiation is successful, or in Montana's case, they all have been, they would go to the full commission and then they would vote. That vote would take it to the legislature. And then we have two different tracks here, one for tribal compacts and one for federal. Um, in Montana, all but one have gone to Congress because with funding authorization required or settlements, uh, congressional approval is required. So once Congress approves it, then it goes back to the tribal membership or council for final approval. So after it's been approved by the state legislature, ratified by Congress, and approved by the tribe, you, the date, the most recent date there is the effective date. Most commonly, that's the date that triggers impl implementation, settlement funding. Um, CSKT is a little unique, and we have a few things that were enacted at state ratification. Um, Slightly more simple path with the federal stuff. These don't require Congress. They just go to the Department of Justice and Agriculture or Interior, depending on if it's uh, Forest Service, for example, obviously went to the Department of Agriculture and the CMR refuge went to Interior. Um, 2013, um, I should note the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument Compact and the CMR Compact were ratified, so the decree, the decree public meetings will be out for those here at the end of the month. Uh, for CMR, end of the next month for uh, Upper Missouri River Breaks. So. Uh, after the final approval, this goes to the court, um, at which point they notice issue the compact in the form of a decree and do their objection in the formal court process at that time. Here's a map. Uh, the resolution on this may leave a little to be desired. I apologize. But uh, you can see uh, we have the seven Indian reservations uh, from the northwest. We have Flathead, Blackfeet, Rocky Boy, Fort Belknap, Fort Peck. Then we have Crow and Northern Cheyenne. Um, Forest Service has a compact. Uh, then we have some other stuff like the Bighorn Battlefield, uh, Yellowstone National Park, uh, Bear Trap Canyon. Here's the Upper Missouri River breaks along the White Cliffs and I think beyond, and then the CMR refuge. So there's a few other wildlife refuges and others scattered around, but that's a uh, large extent statewide, as you can see there. So now moving on, a little more detail on the CSKT compact. So it's been the result of, I would characterize, more than a decade of semi-active negotiations. And as you're probably well aware, the 2015 legislature ratified the compact. That's a pretty simplified overview. So I wanted to drill down here and uh, talk generally about what the compact does. But then I have more of a timeline that kind of paints the history a little, a little better. Um, so some of the key concepts in the compact is the 2015 compact, it balances historic irrigation deliveries. So one of the larger tipping points in this compact is the, flat, uh, the uh, Flathead Indian Irrigation Project, irrigation, uh, and the tribal in-stream flows. These are competing demands for water on the reservation. So that, as you would imagine, is kind of the tipping for, point for reaching a negotiated settlement. So a lot of technical background went into that from all parties, and we were able to reach a, a settlement on that, which was one of the larger challenges here uh, through the renegotiation that occurred in 2014. The compact makes new water available for commercial and irrigation use. It ends the water administration void on the reservation, uh, allows for economic development on and off reservation with uh, conditions of certainty. Um, and then I have highlighted here, facilitates the completion of the statewide general stream adjudication. Realizing there's 
more hurdles for this contract to get through before it becomes finalized. Question, Arnie? Sure, Gretchen. Uh, the second bullet uh, makes new water available for commercial and irrigation use. What is new water? So under the compact, there's uh, the, the Flathead System compact water. It's one of the abstracts. For example, um, the compact. There's compact. Here, here are the abstract. Uh, Hungry Horse water becomes available as does some of the water out of the Middle Fork and maybe some of the Flathead. Um, related to the irrigation project, uh, there's a pump fund that the state will fund that will allow some of that water to be pumped into the project, which will help offset uh, the in-stream flow water rights. So it there's water available there out so of there. So there was unclaimed water in the Hungry Horse Reservoir in I wasn't around, so I'll say this with a little bit of caution, or I can disclose I wasn't involved, but it's my understanding that there have been many efforts to get hands on the Hungry Horse water, and due to Columbia Basin salmon issues, it's been very difficult or if not impossible to get our hands on. So under the compact, there's access to that water. Uh, Non-Indians can lease the water from the tribe on the reservation. Off reservation, it can be leased. So Columbia Falls uh, municipalities up there could lease this water. Okay, so this is my rough timeline of events. I'm going to. Do, I'm not an attorney, so I, I pulled these dates and events out of records of various places. So I think it's the intent of this is for a general painting of the course of history. So don't rely on this for any case law reference or anything. This is me telling you the story over the last three to four decades, um, and we're just going to cruise through this just to kind of paint you a picture that uh, this didn't just happen overnight. Um, so in 1982-83, initial invitation went to the tribes to negotiate. Uh, and I don't have all this memorized, so this is beneficial for me to go through. Some of this is a little bit old. In 82, the Ninth Circuit determined that subsequent acts of homestead and allotment uh, had not diminished the reservation or the tribe's right under the Treaty of Hellgate, and determined the tribes owned the bed and banks of the south half of Flathead Lake and had a right to regulate non-Indian fee land owners with lakeshore property. Um, I don't know if, how close any of you may have followed this through the session, but the fee land ownership of non-Indian irrigators on the irrigation projects is one of the more highly contested issues that remains. So that that's an interesting uh, bit, of, bit of legal history there. Um, 85, the Supreme Court upheld the Montana Water Use Act is sufficient on its face to address tribal and federal reserve rights. Eighty-seven, the Joint Board of Control of the Flathead Mission and Jocko Irrigation Districts versus the United States. So in this case, the Ninth Circuit recognized the tribe's on-reservation fishing rights as superior to those of the Flathead Indian Irrigation Project. Uh, well, I'm, bear with me. I'm learning how to use this mouse. So the Fiati cases, there were three of these. Uh, earlier, I referenced the administrative void on administering water on the reservation. It relates back to this. Uh, the Supreme Court determined that the DNRC lacked jurisdiction to regulate water rights on the reservation until they were resolved through a negotiation or litigation. So that's through a compact or through a water court decree. In 2000, the tribes tendered a detailed proposal to negotiate with the states. The negotiation broke down over the tribe's claim to ownership of all water on and under the reservation. Talks restarted in 2002 through 5 uh, regarding an in, around an interim agreement, which I think the intent was to get around this administrative void. Uh, no interim agreement was ever produced. So those, uh, I think the vehicle, I think the parties realized the vehicle was the compact. 
In 07, the tribes came back to the table with another proposal, and in this one, they conceded on the ownership of all the water, water itself. Uh, that proposal led to the 2013 proposed compact. Um, so we have the 2013 proposed compact. That ultimately died. Um, and we have Representative Tom Woods in the back of the room who's probably got more experience on some of this than me. So Tom, if you want to uh, address any of this, feel free to yell at any point. Uh, your insight would be I'll great. Just yell all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that'd be great. Um, one of the stark differences between the 2013 and 2015 compact, the 2013 compact included this element called the water use agreement, which the Flathead Joint Board negotiated on behalf of the, not on behalf of the state, but they requested they represent the irrigators and ask the state to stay at arm's length. So the Joint Board negotiated that uh, water use agreement. It was a pivotal part of the 2013 compact. Um, for various reasons, I don't know that it was all the water use agreement, it, the 2013 compact didn't pass. Uh, it, it, it died. And that was the trigger point for us commissioning a report, studying this water use agreement, and then the governor uh, asking the parties to come back to the table to renegotiate. The renegotiation was a narrow, limited focus to address stuff that was covered under this water use agreement. And in general, that balanced the on-reservation irrigation diversions and the tribal in-stream flows, the technical uh, operations and management of that. So, Arnie, who does own the water? Most of the water originates off the reservation and flows through it. Well, well, this was a hotly contested topic. I think the state would assert that the state does, but the tribes under the compact have a right, of the senior right to use it. So, I, and I may be repeating myself a little bit, but following the 2013 session, the governor asked the parties to reopen negotiations. Uh, the state conducted a review of the water use agreement and commissioned a report addressing its concerns. And most most of this, any of this stuff referenced, we have reports and documentation on the website. So if you want to drill down or get any of this for a little further information, feel free to follow up with me or check out our website. Um, also, throughout 2013, the Water Policy Interim Committee uh, spent extensive time studying the agreement, not only the water use agreement, but also the compact. They made uh, extensive policy, legal, and technical review, and made ultimately made recommendations to the commission and the parties in the fall of 2014. Uh, after all this, formal negotiations resumed in early September of 2014. The negotiations occurred in Missoula and Polson and staggered, alternated back and forth. Uh, the full commission voted to move the compact to the legislature on January 12th, 2015 at a meeting in Helena. And again, all these negotiating sessions are on the website if you uh, are so inclined. They're, you know, for some water geeks, they might be entertaining and informative, but uh, there are six of them. So. Uh, Senate Bill, 262, uh, the compact was ultimately picked up by Senator Chaz Vincent. He was the Water Policy Committee uh, chairman. He was, spent a lot of time researching it. He picked it up and ultimately led it through the legislature and it, as, as it passed. Um, it was ultimately signed by the governor on the 24th of April. Uh, so that's a little bit of background. Let me move in here to just a little more of a broader education on the CSKT. So this is a map that I think commission staff before I came on board produced. I think it, it references some Smithsonian data here. This map, this red line on the uh, left edge is the Continental Divide. Um, under the compact, as you'll see here in the next few slides, nothing in the compact, though it includes off reservation rights, extends east of the Continental Divide. Then these basin designations here are water court basins. Over the years, the tribes had assured us they would be filing time and memorial in-stream flow rights in those basins. 
which they have now done. So this, as you may well be aware, these are we have the negotiated settlement or the compact. The alternative is the claim filings that are currently stayed at the court that are throughout all these bases in addition to Western Unified. Moving in a little closer here, here is the west of the divide. This, uh, the resolution of the, the symbology leaves a lot to be desired, but let me just cruise through this. This is uh, the off-reservation rights. Uh, I'll follow this up with a table that we can get a little more detail in. But up here in the Kootenai country, we have a main stem Kootenai and stream flow uh, for tributaries. Um, Flathead River comes in here. Off reservation right on the Swan at Big Fork. Uh, some lakes in the Blackfoot. Uh, the Milltown Dam right, which we'll get into in some detail. Some co-owned contract interests on stored water in the Bitterroot out of Como and Painted Rocks, or Painted Rocks and Como. And a lower Clark Fork right near or enforced at Knox and Rapids. So that's a general uh, general geographic uh, map of uh, the offshore reservation stuff. And here's the table. So Kootenai main stem. Uh, so generally, you can see this first batch of rights, they're time immemorial. Kootenai main stem, it's a time immemorial date, which means it predates any non-Indians water claim at the water board. It's as early as it gets. Um, I alluded to earlier kind of call protections and conditioning these water rights to protect existing state-based water use. That's kind of the intent of this column under protections. Uh, so under protections, Libby Dam, so this right is not enforceable so long as Libby Dam is in existence and it's in operated under the terms of the FERC license. Um, even if Libby Dam does disappear, I think water rights under 100 gallons a minute are insulated and there's very few that fall outside of that category. So it's a small number of people that have potentially been impacted. Kootenai River tributaries. These are tributaries of Kukanusa, uh, generally in the Rexburg area. They are all upstream of any state-based private water use. So the effect on any individual state-based rate would be nothing. Uh, ooh, bear with me. Swan River main stem, this right is Few right subject to call, water is still legally available, available in the Swan drainage. Lower Clark Fork, uh, again another time kind of memorial right, tied to the FERC license at Cabinet Gorge. North Fork Placid Creek, this is an interesting one. There's actually, so this is a tributary of the Clearwater River, which is in the Blackfeet, foot, Blackfeet drainage, Blackfoot drainage, excuse me. There is actually a flooded Indian irrigation project diversion upstream of this enforcement point that's an interbasin transfer. That irrigation project diversion takes water over into the Jocko. Um, so the tribes do have a 10 CFS rate on North Park, Park Placid, enforceable below the project diversion. Then we get into a few different categories of ownership. So there's DFWP, the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. So we have a few different uh, arrangements here. Um, 13 rights to be decreed as part of the compact. These are already existing rights and so they don't change any attributes or add any additional water use. They just get the tribe on record as a co-owner. Um, six rights owned by FWP not in the compact decree. The former Milltown Dam right. So this bit right, uh, we'll get into in a little more detail here. It's kind of a large piece of the off reservation compact. Um, it's uh, the rights are bifurcated: one up the Blackfoot and one up the Clark Fork. There's a 10-year deferral period on enforcing it. So you can see here we have them totaled: 23 reaches affected in 15 water core basins, all west of the divide. Here is the dam formerly known as Milltown. It is no longer. So this right was acquired as part of the NRD, the Natural Resource Damage Settlement against ARCO and Northwestern. It's, it's historically a claim for 2,000 CFS of hydropower right with a December 
1904 date, priority date. The compact, um, as of the state ratification, so this has occurred, changes the, the dam right, the purpose from hydro to fisheries. So now it's an in-stream fisheries right, and it bifurcated it. So it split the 2000, uh, a proportional flow up the Blackfoot and a smaller proportion up the Clark Fork. So that, that helps state-based users is the owner of the right can't go and force 2000 CFS up the Clark Fork, which probably is rarely there during irrigation season. Um, upon the effective date, so after ratified by Congress and the tribal membership, the tribes become a co-owner of this right. So um, I've mentioned this state ratification, congressional approval a few times, or congressional ratification. So most compacts, as I think I mentioned, are effective. The effective date, which is a defined term, it's after all the parties have signed off on it. So at this point, only the state has. So we have state ratification. Um, these elements have been triggered as of that. So the Compact Management Committee, the CMC, this is a policy group that oversees a technical team. This committee was implicitly named out in the compact, so it's occurred. It's the NRC director or his designee, uh, the Northwest, the regional director of the BIA, and uh, the tribal natural resource manager. So it's a three-member committee. They provide policy oversight to the technical team. The technical team, I think, is where the rubber is going to hit the road here. So under the compact, a timeline was established. So within six months of the tribal ratification, the technical team needed to be formed. There's an opportunity, uh, five members potential on the technical team. There's a state hydrologist uh, that works for us out of Missoula. His name is Ethan Mace. Uh, the tribal hydrologist, Seth Bakepiece, out of Pablo. Travis Teagarden from the BIA out of Billings. Uh, the current project operator uh, has, is, is named on a team, and there's also a fifth seat potentially available for an irrigator representative. This is another difference that came on board on the 2015 compact, the opportunity for irrigator input on the technical team. As of now, the irrigators haven't gotten together and selected a representative, uh, but the opportunity is there. Uh, it's likely that the first meeting with the technical team will occur in, in November. And the technical team will um, advise the project operator on water efficiency. So the, in the bigger picture, they're trying to balance historic farm deliveries with the tribal in-stream flows. And how can we make the diversions, the conveyances more efficient so more water can stay in the stream? So the historic farm delivery will stay the same, but in-stream flows over time will go up. If the target and minimum in-stream flows are met, there's potential for more water to become available for irrigation as well. But that's that's the tipping point that a lot of the technical wrangling went into over the negotiation. There were $3 million. So under the compact, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think $55 million were committed to by the state and the governor's budget. The House peeled that money out, but the governor put $3 million in for compact implementation. Uh, so that $3 million will be, the technical team will recommend projects for funding back to the governor's office of budget and program planning. So the state has committed to $55 million total, three has been spent. Uh, so in legislator, in the future, uh, the state will, uh, I guess, need to come up with the uh, additional money. $30 million of which I would add is a pump fund, which gets to this water available at a hungry horse in the flathead system that will feed the project reservoirs that will really be a valuable tool in balancing irrigation needs with tribal in-stream flows. And generally, in-stream flows are coming off snow melt of the Mission Mountains, so they uh, would benefit from additional water out of the flathead system. Most of that money for physical infrastructure, basically, to help. Well, uh, yes and no. So this will happen in tiers. So up front, uh, water measurement, on-farm efficiency, and mitigating a stock water loss. A big thing, from what I hear from the technical staff, is 
poor scheduling of water and water running out of the end of a canal. So with better scheduling, if we can avoid that, that's, we're making progress. Uh, those are the three elements that are the focus for the state and I think the technical team up front. I think as more funding comes available and specifically settlement dollars, I'm not going to speak for the tribe, but they've, they've offered to contribute significant settlement dollars to more of the infra infrastructure. And then back to, so yeah, the first technical team meeting, looking forward to that. It's likely going to occur in Ronan, hopefully in early November. So we're working with the parties to get that scheduled. Uh, the, back to the off-reservation Milltown hydropower rate. Right? This is, as I think I mentioned one, once or twice, that, that's another near-term effective at state ratification, the right being bifurcated and the purpose being changed from hydro to in-stream fisheries. So does that account for all of the rights in the Milltown Reservoir then? Is it all settled now? Well, that's a good question. I would say yes, being a water rights geek, I mean, there are, there are another purpose to that Milltown right that we don't explicitly have the water right number listed, but I, that's, a, that's a detail that'll get resolved with the court. I mean, the court's not in the business of decreeing redundant rights. So yes, that Gretchen, the intent is certainly that. I've uh, mentioned this, so we have compacts, negotiated settlements, then we have litigation or claim filings. So the claim filings, as I've heard attorneys characterize, which I am not one of, it's like the largest water, the largest court case in the history of the state, this general stream adjudication. Um, several things have happened over the course of the summer. Uh, the, the part, the, anybody, anybody claiming reserve rights, so we had uh, the CSKT, we had Fort Belknap filed claims before this claim filing deadline with the water court. So those are generally characterized, well, at least in my world, as the staff person for the implementation section, uh, as placeholders to the compact. They're stayed at the court, but they're on record. It's, it's the rules of the road that the legislature set up. So they, they have filed. And just to graphically represent this, so I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, that usual uh, custom map. Uh, here's, here's a map that the tribe produced with their claim filing. So all the green are claims where they filed time and memorial in stream flow rights. So you can see it's a lot of water court basin, so obviously an administrative concern for the state and the water court and, and anybody that might have to litigate against it. Uh, time and memorial in stream flow rates. So, so they inserted this placeholder so that if some if something happens in the process between now and implementation in one of these many steps, they can go to court and reopen the adjudication process in these basins and and have a valid claim. Yeah. That will be adjudicated. Yep. Yeah, and if they did heavy hammer to hold over all the other parties. Well, and they, they uh, if they didn't file those claims, they would have no place at the table to represent the rights. So yeah, but some of these must have been adjudicated. Not that I'm aware of. Really? Well, oh, the basins have right. certainly. Oh yeah, most of these have been. They're at least in the preliminary enforceable decree. None in final decree, but yeah, certainly all the state-based rights that non-Indians have filed have gone through the objection period. They've paid for that. They've paid for their technical work. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a big big deal. Then this next slide, this is, uh, these are the basins included within the compact. So you can see west of the divide, smaller scale. A pretty stark contrast to the claim filing litigation option versus the negotiated settlement. Uh, so I think I touched on some of this. Obviously, we're well positioned, but a long road ahead. Uh, the state 
committed to 55 million in Senate Bill 262, uh, 52 million remain, congressional approval uh, and tribal approval. Um, I haven't been around doing this long enough, uh, but I just returned from a water rights symposium on water rights settlements in Reno, and like 95% of water settlements occur during a lame duck. So the CSKT has assured us that they will be trying to catch a wave before the administration leaves. It's interesting, we, in Montana we have a sequencing issue. We have Blackfeet on its fourth Congress, and now we have CSKT that will be working to get theirs passed as well in addition to Fort Belknap. So we have three pending tribal compacts. And getting anything... Four Congresses. Uh, do these compacts um, require uh, appropriations from the federal budget? Yes. Is that what some Congress people object to? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I'm not going to characterize it. That's a tough one to characterize. I think getting anything through Congress, I mean even transportation legislation stuff is tough. So it, it's just a tough time. I didn't want to include this in the slide, but I just mentioned this water rights symposium. I was at. Coming from Montana, it's interesting. You go to a water rights symposium on Indian water rights settlements and you're kind of like, held in this really high level. People, they keep referring to Montana's process. No other state has a general comprehensive statewide adjudication, which is one of the fundamental building blocks to having this, you know, the, the water court basins all across the state going through decree, but then also establishing a commission that resolves the reserved water rights to the federal government and the tribes. So it's, uh, it's been going on for 30, 40 years here in Montana, which seems like a long time, but other places generally don't appear to have a, they don't have the adjudication framework in place, so it's kind of catch and catch can or when one lands on their windshield. So we've got that going for us. And I, you know, I've, uh, prior to coming on to work as the Compact Commission staff person and now with the implementation section, you'd always hear, I worked in the adjudication. So you this adjudication has been going on forever. It has been a long time, but when you compare it to anybody else, the other Western states, it's, it's, a lot's happened in the last 30 years. So there we have it. I uh, imagine that was a lot of info. Uh, but uh, are there any questions or things to drill down in a little deeper? Yeah. What's that uh, tick rate line you had on the uh, last uh, 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 This, yeah, so this is, comes from some, based on the data, metadata down in the corner, uh, some Smithsonian information. It is the usual and custom places of the, Confederated English Kootenai. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is certainly a general depiction. I would agree with that. But it, they've assured us through the course of negotiation they have strong evidence to pursue claims in those basins. So it's, I would agree it's, it's an arc of general depiction. So this... Billings is right here, this east of that line. So how many of the 18 compacts have made it through the entire process and been implemented? Well, with the exception of the three tribal, uh, so it would be 15. Terrific. Yeah. Well, not quite. CMR and Upper Missouri Breaks and probably Bedoin haven't all been through the, and Fort Keogh and Experimental Sheep Station, those all haven't been through the objection process, but they've, CMR and Upper Missouri will be decreed here very shortly, and the others have been decreed. They're, they're in the process getting close to the end. Recently, Crow was finalized and uh, all OT objections on some of that were, they had an appeal that I think was not upheld, but it's through in court. So I think the Crow settlements 
very close to being finalized at the court level. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, I'll turn this off video recorded, people can hear my question. Um, in the process, the congressional approval process, what, what's really involved? I mean, is it just kind of a stamp of approval, or is there a chance it might actually not be approved, or what does that look like? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So that was one of the recurring themes at this water rights settlement symposium I was at. It, so what happens? And I don't work in this directly, so bear with me. Department of Interior, they have a they established a negotiation and negotiating team. They they have a formalized process and a reporting that I think they send up to the higher levels of interior. And then o, the OBPP gets involved. I think that's the, uh, the uh, they have the final say on the on the money, and they often like to rework things as I've heard it characterized. So, uh, yeah, I don't have an answer for that other than things things happen at the federal level. Yeah. So, so it's not the same as the Confederated What about other tribes asserting rights beyond, you know, like like the Crow, the Coastal Settlement? How how much, I would imagine there's overlap, I and mean, there's obviously overlap here between what's called the Yeah, interesting question. Let me zoom to this map. So you can see in this map where the CSKP filed their off-reservation claims, they took care to not claim within the footprint of another uh, right. tribal sovereign. The CSKT are a Stevens Treaty. The Hellgate Treaty is from Stevens, which is more akin and attributed to other Pacific Northwest tribes with salmon and fisheries. Right. So it had language with the hunting and fishing in common with the citizens of the territory. So the treaty language gave rise to that. The other treaties didn't have that language. In your estimation, what's the likelihood that some of these some of these claims will affect people that are using water and sport closely here? Well, that's a really good question, Wyatt. I hate to even try to speculate on what the judicial the outcome of that would be. Um, I have no idea. I don't know how motivated the tribe would be to enforce these. Uh, you generally, in the in flathead country, they're considered good neighbors. Good question. I, I can't, I won't speculate on answering that. Yeah. And it sounds like a big thrust of the uh, tribe's um, negotiation or what they wanted was to have these in-stream flows. I don't know if you could comment just a little bit on why that was so important to the tribe and um, also then in how that played out with other interest groups. So I don't know where they're sort of like anglers and fishers, people, interested, fisher people interested in um, the, the tribe's purpose there. Yeah, in interesting question. Um, it does seem like some of those interests would be aligned, like out fishing outfitters and folks off reservation trying to maintain some flows. I'm not aware of any discussions or collaboration between the tribes and those entities. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm hesitant to speculate. And what was the other part? Oh, just why, for, um, sort of what was the discourse by the tribe about why the in-stream in flows were so important? Well, good, good question. I wasn't around for this, but let me, I'll speculate a little bit. And, realize I'm speculating. I think looking at the treaty language, I think our legal staff probably briefed the commission on the litigation risk. Uh, so settling, so I think they determined there was some risk. And I think settling on a smaller package of risk in a smaller area with some uh, enforceable language in the, in the abstract that protects people to the maximum extent we could made the state feel like we got the best deal possible for state-based water users. Uh, the tribes, I think, settled for it because they had their treaty rights respected, which I think is a very important thing to them. Yeah. 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 Y
But I'm not speaking for the tribe, that's my personal perspective. Yes? I was also wondering, does the interstate flow just mean that there's going to be more water in these rivers than previously, or does it just sort of just stop? Being an utilizing water that's already in these rivers? Or when is that water coming out? Is that higher for the flood? Or is that like more summer flows? Well, in, yeah, interesting question. There's a diverse package of these, but generally uh, these in-stream flows aren't diversion, so it'd stay in the in the river. When I think about that in the context of Milltown, the hydropower rate right, really wasn't diverting water. It probably had a small evaporative loss for consumption. But I think that's the big point. I think legalizing the water, as you characterized it, I think that's accurate. And then, sorry, just to kind of go back to my question. So my question, and uh, you know, this is something maybe I'd have to go to the tribes to ask. But I'm just curious: was there uh, emphasis on in-stream flows, like to protect historic fishing fishing grounds, or is it sort of is there sort of an intrinsic value to water in a stream for tribes that maybe isn't recognized among other stakeholder groups? Yeah, I'm hesitant to wander into that one. I think they've. They have an extensive water resource department that's done a lot of fisheries, and they have an extensive fisheries department. So I think a lot of the focus is, in my limited time, seems to have been on what we need to maintain and restore bull trout, potentially. Um, as far as traditional fishing grounds, um, based on how scaled back the off-reservation stuff was, I, that's not my sense that that was carried too hard in a, a negotiating stance. But I could be wrong. And I also imagine there's probably some strong traditional fishing grounds within the reservation. But um, the Bitterroot, for example, they have strong history down there. Uh, I never had one-on-one -on -one discussions or was aware of uh, them asserting strong like fishing rights in a specific spot, per se. The secret hole. <laughs> Thank you.